And as a social justice activist, as a person who identifies as a radical, I don't want to be part of any social justice movement that is transphobic, that is homophobic, that is anti-Semitic, that is Islamophobic, that is misogynist, that is patriarchal, that is ableist. No one is free until we are all free. There is no room for any injustice. So, so that's why I didn't think I did nothing too crazy when I went to the UN. They asked me to come to the UN to speak on behalf of the Palestinian people as a representative of civil society, as a non-Palestinian person. For me, as a black person, as an African in America, that meant that I was trying to stand in a tradition of African freedom fighters who have stood in solidarity with the Palestinian people. I'm talking about Malcolm X. I'm talking about Huey Newton. I'm talking about Angela Y. Davis. I'm talking about SNCC. I'm talking about Ethel Miner. I'm talking about all the freedom fighters who stood up and said we must stand against settler colonialism. We must be unafraid to name it. We must be unafraid to call it out. We must be unafraid to stand in justice and freedom and democracy. We stand in the tradition and we will not be moved. We will not back down. We will not be silenced. So I'm flying back from Palestine. And I was near the river. Jordan River, just, I'm just being geographically specific, just to be clear, I don't want them problems, I don't want no smoke, I'm just, I was near the Jordan River and I was traveling, and I flew back specifically for the UN speech. I landed in New York, I went to my crib in Brooklyn, got dressed, came back through, on the flight there I wrote, now I don't write speeches, but I said, you know what, I'm gonna write this one, because I don't want there to be any problems, any controversy. I went and read the previous two years. I think Roger had done a couple. I read your speeches. I was like, oh shit, okay. There's a whole long line of troublemakers like myself. But I said, I will be specific. I will appeal to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We were there in November of 2018, 70 years after the Nekba, 70 years after the great catastrophe and also 70 years after the establishment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And what I was attempting to do was say that there is a contradiction between our universal commitment to human rights ostensibly, our universal commitment to making sure that everyone has freedom and safety and self-determination and dignity and what we see on the ground. When I'm in Khalil, when I'm in Hebron and I'm looking at children have to go through checkpoints and I'm looking at the ritual humiliation of being padded and, and, and searched at the age of six and seven. When I'm in uh, Khan al Ahmar and I'm looking at this village of, of, of Bedouins which is about to be torn down after they built schools out of tire and mud because they couldn't get permits and I'm watching the village be torn down for the sole purpose of settlement expansion when I'm looking on Via De La Rosa as Christians are honoring the stations of the cross and at the very same moment that they look at their savior carrying the cross I'm looking at Palestinian children being stopped and searched and frisked in front of the Armenian hospice I'm looking at these places I'm looking at second class citizenship inside of the state of Israel for African citizens citizens and for refugees and for people seeking asylum. I'm looking at a place where people have a gap between their expressed democratic ideals <laughs> and their lived practice on the ground. And they said, well, like Linda said, why, why Israel? Why not Bahrain? Why not Saudi? We, we, I'm out there too. I can't say enough about what's wrong with Saudi. I can't say enough about what's wrong with Bahrain. I can't say enough about what's wrong with the United States of America. And I promise you, 
I promise you, I I'm already criticizing Saudi. I'm already criticizing Bahrain. And, and I'm already criticizing Syria. I'm already doing these things. But the moment a call comes out of civil society from any of those countries for boycott, divestment, and sanction, I will back them too. It's not about isolating Israel. It's about speaking the truth everywhere. So I, so I gave the speech, and to this day, I mean, I gave a 22-minute speech, and we only talk about the last six words. We have an opportunity to not just offer solidarity in words, but to commit to political action, grassroots action, local action, and international action that will give us what justice requires, and that is a free Palestine from the river to the sea. Like, they make you scared to say them. Was it a window to the wall? Who was it? I can't remember. <laughs> and there was no critique of the speech or the content of the speech. Just this pretext of a critique of those last six words, from the river to the sea. And the question was, why use those words? Well, for a couple reasons. One, people said it's, a, it's from the Hamas Charter. It's also in the Likud Statement of 1974, the platform statement. I don't know if y'all got Twitter, that's Donald Trump's press team. They, if you look at Twitter, Benjamin Netanyahu's son last week, said that he wanted to expand the Jewish state from the river to the sea. It's just fascinating. It's fascinating who gets to use the language and who doesn't. Part of how we police speech is to decide who can have this conversation and who cannot. But let me be clear to you, my dear friends, brothers, sisters, and informants. Shout out to the Mukhabarat in the back. We, when I say from the river to the sea, what I am talking about is a free, democratic, self-determined, safe, and just and equal land for everyone. For everyone. When I'm talking about the river to the sea, I'm specifically talking about the opportunity to talk about what the crisis in Gaza, to talk about what's happening in the West Bank, and to talk about the differential citizenship status for, for Palestinian citizens of Israel. I'm talking about all these areas. I want freedom in each of these areas, and we must be committed to having that conversation. Palestinian freedom does not mean Jewish destruction. It does not mean Jewish marginalization. We can have both. The challenge is that sometimes when you are in a position of power, when you are in the role of oppressor, equality looks like and feels like injustice. Oh my God, men are losing the company. We hired four women. But I digress. We must be committed to this solidarity work. Despite the odds. I can't promise you that if you do this work and speak the truth, that you won't be fired. I almost got fired from a university where I have tenure. Now, think about this. The, the chairman of the board of trustees said that he was morally outraged by my speech, and he had never seen or heard anything so disgusting before. He's Bill Cosby's attorney. <laughs> yeah, Google that. I can't even make this stuff up. Tenure 
is under attack. Our jobs are under attack. Our lives are under attack. What we're experiencing up here is just a small piece of the hell that people are catching around the world for speaking up on this and many other issues. Yes, it's dark. Yes, they're trying to move the embassy. Yes, Trump is imposing policies that Congress has held back on, although they ultimately supported for years. Yes, violence is increasing. There are many reasons not to be optimistic about this moment, but as Dr. King said, it is only when it is darkest that we see the stars. This room is a star. This room is a bright shining light. This room, this movement, this moment is evidence that we will be victorious. We will win. Palestine will be free. Free the land. Free Mumia. Free all political.